watch conversations. Now, I've been a watch geek for decades, since I was about five years old, and if I've learned one thing, it's that looking at a watch online and falling in love with the way a watch looks online, or a watch band, or a bracelet looks online, uh, almost always fails me in, in terms of what I will like on my wrist. So, you should, if you want to watch early, you should make your best guess and pre-order on the 10th, because otherwise you're going to be, like you said, you know, four to six weeks plus. But do that pre-order, and then make yourself an appointment at the store and go try things on. Because all, in many cases, you're going to find, you know, everybody's obsessed with that Milanese Loop bracelet. I've tried it on. I've worn the Milanese Loop bracelet with an Apple Watch, and I hate it. Looks great in pictures. Doesn't look good for me on my wrist. So just bear that in mind. I mean, you, you know, you, you may know yourself better than me, and then you're in great shape. <laughs> just bear that in mind. It's not like buying a phone where you can see what you're doing, and, and it's it, you know it's a whole lot more personal when you put it on yourself. So just bear that. All right. Oh, we got all kinds of things we got to get by day. Okay, let's turn off Wi-Fi, and that should deal with it. All right. So we're going to talk about managing your mobile life. Uh huh. Um, we're small enough here, so, uh, and I built this presentation in the event that I couldn't make it here and we had to do it over Skype, so it's going to be a little bit more uh, detailed on the screen than I normally would do if I knew that I was going to be here for sure. But uh, in terms of a question policy, we're small enough that uh, I'm happy to take questions as we go, but I reserve the right to change that rule if uh, all of you or even some of you uh, get a little long-winded, and then we might hold things either for the end or somewhere in the middle. Uh, everything you see on the screen here will be delivered to Jerry and Chris, and then presumably disseminated to the rest of you as a PDF. Take notes if you like, but you certainly don't have to if it's on the screen. So let's talk about what kind of a mobile user are you. Uh, anybody in the room that is never mobile, doesn't, only accesses data when you're at home at your computer. Okay, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, occasionally mobile. Maybe you have an iPad or a laptop kind of thing, and then uh, always crazy mobile, which is me with an iPhone and everything else. Okay. Any of you with your hands up want to come and uh, do this and I can sit and watch? No. <laughs> okay, what does it mean to be mobile? Um, away from your main computer is what we're going to... Um, or away from your home, I guess we should say, because your main computer might be your laptop. And when you're away, you can browse the internet. That's one thing. These are all just different things that we can do when we're mobile. And we're going to talk about how to do each of these. Okay? Uh, you can check and manage your email is another thing you can do. You don't necessarily, you're not necessarily going to do all of these things to be mobile. These are just examples. You can access your files. You can create documents, which is different than just looking at documents you've already created. Uh, going a little deeper, maybe you can access your home computer remotely, and maybe you'd want to do that. Going a little bit deeper, maybe you want to access your entire network and maybe print to a printer at home remotely. And then if you're crazy like me, maybe you want to manage your network remotely. And, uh, and sometimes that's handy, especially when you're on the road and family calls and says something won't work. Sometimes it's easier just to fix it than it is to try and walk from someone through doing the same. Okay, so I figured I'll tell the story of my mobile life, and then we'll relate that to what you can do, and you get to pick uh, how you want, how much, how crazy you want to be, because I'm pretty much in control. <laughs> so my email's in sync everywhere. What that means is if I reply to an email from my phone and then archive that email when I go back to my computer at my desk, that email's already archived in the replies in my sent folder. Super handy, and actually it's easy for you to get there. All of my documents are available everywhere, and I do that in a variety of ways, but anything I create um, or download or anything, I can get to no matter where I am, and that has proven handy at times. For example, here, I didn't. this is the first time I've opened this presentation on this computer. Um, I didn't copy it to this computer manually, it just made it here, and we'll talk about how that happens. My calendars are available and in sync everywhere, so if I check my calendar and change an event on my iPad, it's immediately reflected on my phone and my laptop and everywhere else. The same with my contacts. My music is available everywhere. So I'm a, uh, not only a musician, but I'm a music fan. Really like
have to have access to everything and be able to play whatever I want to play no matter where I am. And uh, the same with my movies. It's really nice to be in a hotel room and say, you know, I have that movie on the uh, drive at home. I'd love to watch that right now. And presumably, if bandwidth's available, I can do it. It's super handy. Uh, and I can move, essentially, uh, I can move from device to device and just maintain access to everything, which sounds great until you live it, and then suddenly you realize you're tied all the time, and it's, you know, just like, we all got to get a break. That's why I go into flotation tanks for the rest of the time. It's okay. John, it drives John crazy, because we come out of the tank with all these crazy ideas. But that's, um, we can talk about that later. <clears throat> Let's talk about email. Have you ever had to go into the tank after him? <laughs> Not going there. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is I watched that movie. Altered States? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, 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 yeah. That's, that's, that's the tank I've been in. I didn't turn, you don't turn, well, never mind. Um, <laughs> never done it on DMT. I mean, it's, you know, it's a whole different thing. Uh, okay. Where are we? <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, there's two different ways, uh, common ways of accessing your email. Um, POP and IMAP, and we'll talk about both. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about the cloud today. By the cloud, I mean accessible to you over the internet. And we're going to talk about private cloud and public cloud, and it's all kind of the same. The cloud is just basically the internet, or however you're going to get to your data. Pop email, essentially, and everything can be tweaked. But, uh, so uh, you're, what internet provider? It, I, I, I did some research, but I might have been wrong. It sounds like at least like in this area, Comcast is what most people have. Is that right? Comcast, Comcast. Opti Optimum, and Cox. OK, so Optimum does reach up this, this yeah. far, far enough to get some of the people in the room. Yeah. I know you have it, John, but I wasn't sure about anyone else. Okay. And then and, and AT and T, which was With in this DSL. area, brought by, brought out by Frontier. Ah, okay, okay. So, uh, all right, we'll, we'll get there. So, everybody that offers email, all your ISPs are going to offer you pop access. What this is is email comes into your email server, which sits in the cloud, and then one of your devices goes and checks email and pulls the email down and deletes it from the server, and that's the end of it. It, it doesn't live on the server uh, full time. IMAP means that the server is the master. Email comes into the server and stays there. Your clients simply sync with it, and if you make a change, it sends the change to the server so that if you have four different devices, an iPad, an iMac, an iPhone, and a Windows machine, it doesn't matter what it is, they all see that change reflected amongst all of them. Uh, they take a copy of what's up on the cloud and save it locally so that you have a copy locally and it's faster. But any changes you make are sent up to the server. This is how I maintain my email everywhere. Um, now, Comcast, is in terms of iCloud, Gmail, uh, even AOL support IMAP these days, um, Comcast now supports IMAP for everyone was in beta up until, I think, about three or four months ago. And it's super handy, and it's it's the way to go. I don't know about Cox. Cox does IMAP. They do. But it's the same story, that slow rollout. And OK, yeah. right, right. So if, if you can, how many people in the room know that they're only using POP for their email? Is anyone? OK. So if, if, if you only have one computer, that's fine. Uh, if you have more than one device moving to IMAP either with your current provider or with a uh, with another provider like iCloud or Gmail, which, and Gmail's free, and it works fairly well with IMAP. If we can talk about Google being weird, but that's a whole other session. Uh, but it, it, it works, and it, it really makes, you know, I find my email is the, the one thing that I just well, I obsess over it. For those of you that want the link to how to set up Comcast IMAP, I put that in the presentation so you can find it. It is relatively new as of, what was it, last three four months? Yeah. Is either one more secure than the other? No. Email is not secure. Uh, in, in a 
general sense. It, there are ways of making it secure if you and the recipient agree on a way of doing that. Um, either PGP or for the Mac, it's called GPG tools for the Mac. Uh, or you can set up an S-MIME certificate. None of it's rocket science. None of it is straightforward. Um, but email in general is sent plain text over the internet. It is stored plain text on all the servers. And if someone like Gmail or Apple or anybody chooses to keep an archive of everything that has come through their server, every bit of email you've sent and received is happily stored there, unencrypted, um, for anyone, including the NSA, to look at. Yeah, it's not secure <clears throat> at all. <laughs> even email you store, it, even if you run your own mail server, you're not really changing a whole lot of that picture because in order to, in order, if I run my own mail server, which I don't advise anyone to do, I used to do it. It's a horrible thing. It's a nightmare. Uh, but if you do, if I did. As soon as I sent email to you, it's out of my hands. That's it. I mean, the whole point of email is I'm sending it to someone else. Right? So, uh, yeah, you got it. Yeah. Any other questions? We good? Okay. Am I moving too fast? Go, go on the next page. Everybody's happy. All right, good. If I got the guy in the back nodding, we're in good shape. Before you leave mail, you said when you respond to an email message, it syncs no matter where you are. Is that because of IMAP? It is. So what happens is every mailbox, not just your inbox, but every mailbox uh, that you don't specifically create as an offline mailbox will be synced with the server. So by default, IMAP has four mailboxes. Inbox, sent, trash, and drafts. So when you send a message, again, by default, you could set your mail client to do this differently. <laughs> But by default, your mail client is going to create the message, it's going to send it, and then it's going to leave a copy of it in your sent folder. That sent folder is sync is sent is an IMAP synced folder. So it puts it in your sent folder on your Mac, that folder is synced with the cloud, and then that folder is accessible from all your devices. Make sense? Yeah, I I can't get that to work with, with at least dot Mac mail, huh. which is IMAP. Yeah, right. But right. I, I respond with my uh, uh, iPad uh, to an email message, I never see it on my Mac. Okay. I never see the sent. Yeah. So uh, we can talk about this after, but there is a setting. If you go into the settings app, go to mail, contacts, and calendars, go to the account, your iCloud account, go to advanced. You get to set the mailboxes that sent trash and draft get get stored to, and chances are you'll see that those, as, as you tap into each one, as you tap into the sent one, certainly, it will be listed as uh, on my device as opposed to oh, on my server. server. Got it. And just change it to that. And your iPhone may wind up being the same way. Um, <coughs> it shouldn't be by default, but yeah, confusing. There's a reason we've been doing Mac Geek App for 10 years, right? These questions come in all the time. Things don't always work the way we expect them to. They work the way they were told to work. I just had that issue with the you know, little account setting up on the Mac. They created a bunch of folders for me. Couldn't figure everything out. Right. So you basically click on the folder and say use it as the mailbox. That's right. And change it to, you know, this one's the sent. This, this one's sent. Yeah. Yep. And you, that's right. You can assign any folder uh, as as the sent folder. Cause, because some mail servers call it sent. Some call it uh, sent items. It, it, yeah. Sent messages. Sent message. That's actually what Apple calls it. A sent message. That's right. Are you Are you going to talk a little later about switching over from Pop to IMAP? We can talk about it right now. Mail. It seems to me it's a good thing. We can spend as much time as you want. Um, sort of. Like I said, I reserve. I've, right been, I've been afraid. I, you I should found be. out a few weeks ago yeah. that it was available. And you should be afraid. Yeah. Well, because if you do well, if you do it wrong, you will lose all your email. The first thing you have to remember is chances are the only place your email exists in, in grand sum total is on your Mac. And when you delete a pop account, if you go into mail and say, you know, delete this account, when you delete a pop account, it doesn't put your mailboxes in the trash, it deletes them forever. So it is a very quick way to lose your entire history. So you don't want to do that. What you do is create your IMAP account in mail along
alongside your pop account. So you leave that alone. Okay, good. That's it. That's as far that's as you That's step one. Got. Okay, so, so that's step one. And then uh, go into each of the mailboxes that's on the IMAP, that's, uh, that's, that's listed as part of your pop account. It'll kind of be in the hierarchy list. And go into each one and move the messages, say, from your inbox, from the pop account, to the inbox of your IMAP account. Then when that's finished, go into the sent items and move it all the stuff from sent and trash if you care about it and drafts if you care about it and any other fold that's probably all that exists and you might not even have a drafts folder um, but once you've moved those you can actually go online and check to make sure that those messages are in your new IMAP account and once you see them there um, as long as you have a backup of your Mac which you should have anyway then you can feel comfortable deleting your pop account. Does that make sense? Yes, and it's not that hard. No, it's not, not hard. Not, not even that scary. No, it, it, right. You just need to be meticulous about the process. Um, if you go to the Mail's window menu, there's an option for activity. Uh, that will show you more about the process of it moving all these messages. So the best thing is to wait until the activity window has nothing in it, and then email mail is finished with whatever operation you completed. And it's going to take a long time for those activities to finish, so be prepared. Yeah, because you're up, you're taking all that data from your computer and uploading it to the server. So it depends on how much you have. If you know, if you've been using Pop for a week, probably not so much. But you probably can handle it. Okay. Good. Thanks. Uh oh. No, no, I yep. just want to add something. Yeah. Because Dave encouraged me to move over from Pop to the other. Dave gives me lots of good advice. And I don't know if this is true, but in this case, at one point, you were like, John, you know, John, with Pop. You know, the thing is, I'm with Ops Online. They only offer. Thanks, John. It's like Mac Geek Cab uh, for you. Live. That's very nice. Live. Live. There you go. Yeah, we didn't get to do this at Macworld this year. That would have been last week. So. Uh, yeah. All right. So moving on to accessing uh, your <coughs> files. And we're going to talk about cloud types. I mentioned public versus private. Uh, we're going to define public today as stored on someone else's server. Okay? A server that you don't own a server that you don't manage, a server that you don't really have access to other than this conduit for your files. You have no idea how someone's storing your data, but uh, that's public cloud. Private cloud means you're storing it on your computer or your company's computer or your friend's computer uh, or a, a device that you have. It doesn't have to be a computer with a screen. It could be a device without a screen. And we'll talk about all of that stuff. So that's th those are our definitions that we're going to use going forward. Okay. Talking about public cloud, Dropbox is probably the most common one. Does anybody here not know what Dropbox is? Okay, perfect, great. So essentially, you're syncing a folder or folders from your Mac with the cloud, and the nice part about that is you can then take your iPhone or your other Macs or your other Windows machines or whatever you have and access any data that you have put into that folder on your Mac. Data is accessible from everywhere, even if your Mac is off. This is very, very handy. The data is stored on Dropbox's servers, uh, and then it is synced to yours, like IMAP. IMAP is a public cloud in that sense. Uh, that you are just syncing a copy of what's in the server. If you delete something from your computer, it sends that change up to the cloud, and then that file no longer is in the cloud. Dropbox holds a history so you can restore things that you've accidentally deleted, or that someone else has accidentally Dropbox has a freemium model. 
Uh, it's zero dollars if you only want to use a. I think do they allow five gigs now? Yeah, right, five. Uh, or you can pay a hundred bucks and and get uh, hundred gigs and store all kinds of stuff up there. There are security risks with this because, of course, the data is stored on Dropbox's servers. It is encrypted in transit and it is encrypted in storage, but you don't have the key. Dropbox has the key, and and that's a convenience. That's the, it's done for for the reasons of convenience. Uh, you have your password that gets you into your account, but the actual encryption is done with Dropbox's key, and that way you can grab your iPhone and access the same data without having to put some big, long encryption key into your iPhone as well. This is really convenient, but you know, I always say that we live, we choose our, our place in the continuum uh, between uber convenience and uber secure. And Dropbox leans towards the convenience side, although as I said, in transit, the data is secure. I'd like to say that your data on Dropbox is secure until a subpoena. <laughs> and so you need to just, you can take that and evaluate it however you like. Uh, but Dropbox does have access to it, so if their hand is forced, they would have to turn it over. Uh, they said they will fight this, and they have. Yeah. Hmm. So one password, that's interesting. One password is actually an encrypted um, storage file that you sync with Dropbox. So Dropbox could in theory be forced to turn over your one password database, but it's encrypted and you don't, and, and it's encrypted with your key. So you're actually okay there. Yep. Dropbox yeah. is still just two gigs free. Just two, okay. Yeah. If you invite friends, you can get up to five and, or more. Even more. Get an Android phone, you get 50 gigs free with Dropbox. What? Yes, for a year or two, depending on which phone. Yeah, that, that's right, it's a limited time thing. But then you have to buy another Android phone. <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> okay, so that's public cloud. And public cloud also includes things like Box and, and uh, well, SugarSync. Actually, they're still on the list. But there's lots of them, and there, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it's really handy because the one benefit of public cloud is it makes it super easy to share data with other people without having to, you know, drive them crazy. Private cloud, device in your house. I'm going to start with the easiest one. It's called Transporter. It's a separate little device. You plug it into your network. It's accessible if your Mac is off because it's a separate little device. Similar to Dropbox, you put an app on your Mac and then whatever you put in your transporter folder or folders is synced to the device. Um, it's a single disk and it's cheap. Uh, for 99 bucks, actually I think even 79 now, uh, for a limited time you can get a device that you just hang a USB disk off of or you can go up to I think it's 349 and, and get uh, you know, a, a couple of terabytes of storage. Similar to Dropbox, it is accessible when you are away from your network creates a path through your router so that uh, anybody, well, anybody with access to it can get data from it. You can share with your friends. You can create shared folders. It is the easiest way to do private cloud uh, at home. It requires 10.75 or later. Uh, files synced as folders, or you can you, you can have it synced, as, as we talked about with Dropbox, or you can directly access the device, which unless you're on your local network is going to be slow over the internet. It's very bare bones, uh, but that's by design if they keep it simple. This is from the same people that brought you Drobo or brought us Drobo years ago. They, their, their focus is on simplicity. And the software started out kind of clunky and weird, and now it's actually in good shape. So It's a great way to get yourself off of Dropbox, either for cost reasons, because once you buy this, you're finished. There's no maintenance, uh, you know, you don't pay every year, it just works. So that's Transporter. We'll get a little more complex, uh, but not too much more complex, with Synology. There's various price points, they start at 179. That's with one disk in it. You can move up from there and get multi-disk redundancy, which uh, depending on how many disks you have, you get, um, if one disk dies, you, your data is still actually accessible, which 
is super handy, especially if you're storing lots and lots of data. It can be a real, <coughs> a real bummer if your drive dies and that's the end of your data. Uh, Synology also has hundreds of apps. So yes, they have this thing that they call Cloud Station, which is private cloud. But they also have things called Audio Station, Video Station, Photo Station, which allow you to sync your audio, your movies, and your pictures. Um, Synology, to make setup easy, came out just this year with something called Beyond Cloud, uh, which is a way of, uh, you buy this out of the box for 179 bucks, and it comes with all of these things here set up and ready to go. You can add more. It's the normal Synology interface, but you don't have to. And it makes life really easy. Uh, you can then add other apps like Plex or Crash Plan or if you want to run your own Minecraft server. This is another computer running in your house, and it's really cool. If you're at all interested in setting up private cloud, this is the way to go. Um, it, 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 it's easy to get started, and the sky is the limit. It really is fun. It will turn you into a geek if you're not one already. They, they do. They make it easy. Uh, but they also don't limit you. So, and, and like I said, Beyond Cloud makes setup a total breeze. It, it really lowers that, that technical barrier to entry to just get you up and running and get you hooked. Right? And then, you know, when you have a free Saturday, three months down the road, maybe you start tinkering, and then suddenly it's Monday morning, and you realize you haven't slept yet, and you've got to go to work, and it's fun. So that's Synology. Any questions about that? Anybody here use Synology? Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're welcome to the club. We've got jackets. Yeah. 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 It's cool, though, right? It's, it's, it's an option. It's a great device, but the transporter, as you say, they really have come a long way. They have a lot of bugs. That's the mindset. But they have really become very, very good. Yeah. And I've dealt with their customers for a long time. And for the global business. Yeah. I have the 5G. I'm glad to hear that. That's good. That's good. Yeah, they're good people there, especially now that the – so it, it, Drobo started, and then the management team left, and Drobo kind of kept going but floundered a little bit, and they started Connected Data, which is the company that makes the transporter, and then the original founder actually came back and is now running Drobo again. So, yeah, it's a, there was a rocky road there, but – That's awesome. That's great. That's impressive. That's great. Cool. All right, so I mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you use uh, for, like, what's your primary use? The Synology is my primary thing. Uh, I use the transporter for a few things, but I could, it's a great device, but I could live without it, right? My, my needs are covered basically by Synology. Just because it's more full, it, it can do more, and so I, I just put everything there. So you start off with one you choose to get Synology? I would. If you're, yeah, unless you really only want private cloud and don't want to have to think about anything else, in which case the transporter is simple, really simple. Um, especially if you want to share with others, the Synology starts getting really weird when you want to do that. Uh, it's doable, but it's just not easy, whereas with the transporter, it's Okay, so now we'll talk about music everywhere. Uh, I mentioned Audio Station when I was talking about Synology, and that is a fantastic way to do this. So uh, having a NAS device, which is essentially, what, which is what, it, what the Synology is, network attached storage, you've got gobs and gobs of storage in this device. And so you're gonna be tempted, and rightly so, to start putting all your media files out there, because why not? It's accessible to all the computers in your house. And so you, if you sync your, your uh, iTunes library or all of your music to this device, you can start doing some fun things with it because it's not only a storage device, it's a computer. And you can play uh, songs, either streaming or syncing, direct to your, uh, direct to your iPhone. So if I, if I open up my iPhone here, and hopefully this, this will work, we'll do a real-time demo. So uh, I open up this app, 
and I log in, hopefully it'll log me into my device at home and we don't have uh, some bandwidth issue. And it should give me access to about 30,000 songs that I have at home. And we'll pick one and we'll stream it. Or maybe because we're in a cement building, we won't. Uh, I have, oh no, here it comes, okay. Let's see how, we'll see how quickly this goes. But this is essentially, yeah, so, you know, we just, uh, we go to ACDC, we go to the Back in Black album, and in theory, That's it, and that's streaming direct from my uh, from my disk station at home. Real easy. It's doing it over cellular data, and now it will have saved a copy of that on my device. You can set how big the cache is that you want to have on the device. You can download entire albums. You can build playlists. And the nice part is everybody in my family has access to this. It's not, um, you know, and it and there's no additional cost for it. And that's one thing I really like about Synology is they have iOS apps that they build for all kinds of things, and we'll talk about more of them. You know that app works great in my car with Bluetooth. Yeah. The uh, when you put all your music on the server. Yep. When, and you have a Mac at home, let's say, and you start up iTunes, you import it in there. Does it? What about DRM and all that? How does that work? Yeah. So um, <laughs> it will not play DRM to iTunes songs, but iTunes doesn't sell DRM songs anymore, and hasn't for a long time. Okay. If you have older ones, there are ways of, of getting rid of that, and iTunes Match, which we'll talk about in a minute, is actually one of them. Okay. Um, and, I, and I recommend iTunes, I'll, I'll explain in a minute, but yeah. Okay. But uh, you know, it's playing, I'm sure that's a Apple release M4A AAC, you know, iTunes Plus file, mm -hmm. and it plays just fine. Yeah, and it'll, it'll actually play more formats than iTunes. It'll play FLAC, and, Log and all that stuff. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to ask you. Okay. The formats of music. Yep. Like it's blue. pretty much everything that you could ever imagine. ESB and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, that one I'm not sure about. But yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. What do you store on your Mac now? <laughs> that's a good. That's a good question. I don't have to store anything. I mean, I could. I could store my documents and just sync those. Uh, which is what I do. I could, for my Mac at home, just point it directly to my Synology and have it read my music library directly on the Synology. I don't. Um, when I started with the Synology, uh, you know, I was getting my feet wet with it and didn't want to overcommit, so I just synced my music library to it. And now I have it sync my music library three times a week. I use Carbon Copy Cloner to do that. And that process has worked well for me. It gives me two copies of my music library in case I screw something up, and it works fine. So, so that's that's how I do that. Yeah. yeah. Does the Synology have a backup apparatus? Yeah. So it, it does. It has its own backup uh, program app within it uh, that you can back up either to another Synology or you can hang a USB drive off of most Synology units. They have USB ports on them, and you can back up to that. Or you could run CrashPlan on the Synology and have it back up to CrashPlan's cloud. And it's the same price as backing up a computer. So, yeah. um, this, the, as I mentioned, you know, audio station, all these things, once you get the Synology, all these things that are sort of built into it are free. Uh, iTunes Match, I mentioned. So this is an, an, another way. You can use iTunes Match separate from the Synology. It's actually quite great. Uh, you just sign up for it within iTunes on your Mac. It will sync all of your music up to 25,000 songs, and we'll talk about that, to the iTunes cloud. Uh, they call it iTunes Match because if iTunes has the song already, it won't upload it to the cloud. It'll just say, yep, you have access to this, and then it's done. So you probably wind up uploading 10% of your library in, in most cases, either because things that should match don't and that happens, or because you have something that they don't and that happens too. Um, it's 25 bucks a year, again, plus bandwidth if you pay for bandwidth, and that can start getting significant as you're sending media files around. It does have one little bonus, and that is, and, and this is why I recommend that anybody with any sizable music library signs up for iTunes Match at least for a year. You 
get to auto upgrade all your songs. So if you have, if you took your CDs a long time ago and ripped them into iTunes at 128K and did it with poor quality, if iTunes matches those songs, you can then go ahead and download full iTunes 256K AAC quality songs of, or, or copies of all of those songs you already own and have them replace the songs that you already have in your library that are lower quality. It's worth 25 bucks to not have to go back through your CD collection and re-rip everything. Mm -hmm. Every day. <laughs> yeah. What about the, uh, back in the day when I ripped everything, it was MP3. Yeah. And now I, what do you recommend for, is it? Well, well, that's, that's going to work, right? I mean, if I rip back in black to, you know, 128K MP3, mm -hmm. I sign up for iTunes Match, iTunes Match scans my library, it sees that I have Back in Black, and iTunes says, okay, I have that, so now you have access to it. Then you download from iTunes Match the upgraded copy and replace your crappy MP3. Okay. It's awesome. Yep. And it's pretty easy to do. There's actually an article on Macworld that Jason Snell wrote uh, when he was with Macworld <laughs> that explains doing all this with smart playlists and, and, and kind of sectioning off pit bits of your library, and, and it it won't take you very long at all. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, Amazon's cloud player is similar. It has a it has a benefit and it has uh, uh, one thing against it. The benefit is that it will do two hundred fifty thousand songs, so ten times the songs that iTunes Match will do for you. Uh, if you have more than twenty five thousand with iTunes Match, mm -hmm. you I, you're going to run into problems unless you create two separate iTunes libraries and limit them each to 25, or multiple iTunes libraries, I should say, and limit them to 25,000. Amazon Cloud Player doesn't have that problem. It goes up to 250. The only problem, and this is where some audio purists get all baby armed, is Amazon iTunes matches to AAC at 256K. Amazon matches to MP3 at 256K. And you can't tell the difference with everything, but with some stuff, especially some jazz and classical, you can tell the difference that MP3 is not quite the same quality as AAC. But again, you know, we're getting into it. Yeah. You may not care. So you know young parents don't care. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to need beer if we're going to have the Neil Young conversation. So the Amazon thing is it? How much does that cost? Same price. 25 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's taking that concept and applying it to movies. Movies everywhere. So iTunes, uh, if anything that you rent or purchase from iTunes, you can have on your Apple devices. Rentals obviously are limited for the period of time that you rent it. Uh, anything you purchase, no problem. Uh, you can access from any of your Apple devices that are tied to your iTunes store account. The nice part is all those apps are built into iOS. They're on your Mac. And they work great, uh, as long as you're willing to live in that ecosystem and use those apps, it's fine. If, however, you have bought a DVD or a Blu-ray and have ripped that into your library, so you bought it legally, you rip it into your library, iTunes is not going to give you access to that everywhere. I've heard of some people having a semi-iTunes match experience with video. It's certainly not the norm, and I think they're confused. But maybe it happens. I've never seen it. Um, so we're back to the Synology. The Synology has Video Station. I have all of my videos except for iTunes purchases because they have copy protection on them. And Synology can't read that. So I don't buy anything from iTunes. I buy DVDs and rip them so that I have no copy protection on my, uh, on my movies. I store them on my Synology. Uh, there's the Video Station app that sits on the, the NAS at my house, and again, I've got an app called DS Video that sits on my iPhone and my iPad. I can sync movies to it for offline viewing for when I'm on an airplane and not online, or I can stream to it. Uh, I say I have streaming only in here. I don't know why I have that. Um, it, it does let you download. Uh, it works great. Uh, it didn't used to, but I don't know why. I don't know why I still have that. It's false. So, yeah. How about downloads from other sources like Amazon or? As long as, um, I'm trying to think, Amazon downloads. What form? No, Amazon movies are in the, 
commandments, you're only getting those through the Prime browser. You'll only see them in your web browser. There is no offline version of Amazon Meetings. Um, so no, you can't get those. You, you just got to rip them uh, from the keys. And it's not that bad using Handbrake. It's pretty easy, pretty straightforward. And then you've got the copy you want. So, any other questions? Good? Right, so you have the movies that you purchased from iTunes. No, I have ripped movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they don't show up on all your devices, do they? Well, I have the, my iPhone, so no, they're not. When you sync them from iTunes? Well, I just have it on iTunes. I can batch it out. I want to see that later. I want to see, yeah, because that, because I, like I said, I've heard of this. And I'm curious to see how it, how that works. Yeah, I didn't okay. think iTunes batch had anything to do with anything but you. That, that's that's the official statement. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. So I know I can download this. Right. It's not right. on this phone right now. Okay, but it could be. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be because I didn't download it. Either. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about Blu Blu-ray ripping? I'll send you to an article. There's a that I, that I wrote. There's a forty dollar Blu-ray drive you can buy from Amazon, and then um, using Make MKV and Handbrake, you can rip those just the same as you rip anything. It is, and then you use, um, all right, now we're gonna get geeky. Uh, then you use, so there's a guy named Don Melton, okay? He, he wrote uh, Safari and was on the Netscape team before that. He's retired from Apple and I'm sure he did just fine. Um, probably not looking for work. And so he has a lot of free time and he wrote some, he, he really liked the, the quality of Apple's movies that you get from iTunes, but he hated the DRM. And so he wrote a bunch of scripts that walk Handbrake through converting movies in the format that Apple does. He pulled all his, he won't tell you this publicly. He pulled all his friends at Apple, he found out exactly what they're doing, and then he basically built public domain scripts that'll do the same thing, or pretty close to it. And, and I can give you a link to that too. We'll, I'll, I'll bake that into a good PDF. But that's, you take your 25 gig, uh, Blu-ray, and you can shrink it down into probably a 4 gig M4B file. Yeah. Don's a good guy. Uh, if you don't want to run Synology Video Station, uh, which really is doing mostly everything that anybody's going to want, Plex uh, will work. And Plex you can run in concert. You don't have, it's not either or. You can run this on your disk station or on your Mac, pointing it at your library. Um, it's free to stream. 40 bucks a year if you want offline sync, and you can share your library with friends as well. So, uh, Plex is a pretty cool thing. If anybody wants, if anybody wants to share access to our Plex libraries, just shoot me an email and we'll sync up. It's always fun. Yeah. So, movies everywhere. How do I get the movies to my Apple TV at home if I have ripped them? And I'm glad you asked. Okay. So, Synology has done something magical. In theory, the only thing that can stream to your Apple TV is iTunes, mm -hmm. but your Synology can too. It can. It can. It, there is no interface on the Apple TV to talk directly to the Synology, so you'd have to start it either from a web browser or from your phone, but you tell it stream directly to the Apple TV, and then you can shut your phone off. Your phone has nothing to do with it. It's just the remote control. But once it starts on your Apple TV, you can even use your Apple TV remote to pause and and, you're, and is that an app you're sending it to, or are you going to a web page? You, you, again, you start it from a web page, or you start page. it from the video app. I see, okay. But you just, it, it, it streams directly from your disk station to the Apple TV. Really? Yeah, okay. they shouldn't be allowed to do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't tell I mean, it breaks everything. Right, right. But they've been doing it for years. Really? Okay. Yeah. Erica Sadoon, who's a, a programmer and also a journalist, mm -hmm. deconstructed the um, AirPlay video algorithm and published it, and I have to assume that Synology just said, great, we'll use that. And so far, Apple hasn't stepped in and said, you know, no. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's, there's also other companies that come out with software, like where, where they let you stream from an older Mac. Yes. Yeah, but then you're, but still your Mac's in the middle of that, of that equation, as opposed to going directly, well, no, because if you're running AirParrot, your Mac has to be running in order for the movie to appear on your Apple TV, 
Whereas with this, it's streaming direct from your disk station, right? So, yeah. But again, as long as the quality you're getting to your TV is okay, you know, enjoy the movie. <laughs> Get some popcorn, doesn't matter. Yeah. There was a question over here, do we address it? No, okay. All right, <coughs> moving off of media, moving to calendars and contacts, iCloud is actually a, a fantastic way to go. It's free, yep. I do not. I just have an Apple TV connected. Yeah. I, I, go, I mean, the Apple TV is fine. Um, I could do more if I had a computer connected. Uh, I got computers connected to enough things. <laughs> and again, with AirPlay on the Apple TV, I can stream anything from any of my devices to it. So, you know. Does anybody have Apple TV as well as like Chromecast or Roku? Yeah. Are you Chromecast? Yeah. So between the two, what's your favorite device? I used to use Apple TV a lot, but since I got the Chromecast, it's pretty easy to just run anything through it. Yeah. So That's I interesting. Use it less. You use yeah. it less? Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting. Somebody have a Roku, did I hear? Yeah, you do? Yeah, I have three Rokus and I have a Chromecast. Okay. And no Apple TV? No Apple TV. And you don't need one? Apple TV is restrictive. Uh, it's very restrictive. Absolutely. So uh, Roku's got so many apps. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Roku has a Flex app, so you can navigate. Right. Your... I've done Flex. But the only thing about Flex, Flex on your desktop, is very, very cross between the kind of stuff you just can hear the fan go on. That's right. And it does not like if you have your own home movies. Let's say it will go out and match art. Yeah. And not. And not get and it not right. The nicest matches either. Right? Yes. Yeah. You need to be careful. Synology does that too. The video station app will match, and, and it, it actually does a pretty good job. There's, if you name your movies in the right format, it right. you really have to helps. know the metadata. You have to know, right? You got to be there ahead of it. But there was like, Correct. this is an example. I, I have a daughter named Ashley, like I'm about to bring another piece of it. Oh yeah. And so one of the movies, you know, and there's like, there's the art. <laughs> no, it's she was it's just a whole. <laughs> Right. Yeah. 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 That can get embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Okay. Uh, moving on to calendars. Are we good? Can I? That, yeah. That's more than I've ever spent on the video stuff. But clearly, we struck a nerve, so that's good. Uh, okay. Calendars and contacts. Uh, I, again, like I said, iCloud makes this really easy. It's free. Uh, there is web access to it, so you can see your data there. Uh, there's no Android syncing with iCloud, and I, I say that there's no supported Android syncing. You can do it. iCloud uses CalDAV, which is a standard that Apple helped write, and CardDAV, again, another standard that Apple helped write. So you can make this work. It's just not. Uh, the cloud is not reliable, though. It's but, not. But there are apps for Android that sync with iCloud. There are. That, that are quite well. <coughs> yeah. It works nicely. That, yeah, it, do, it does work. Apple's not going to support it, but it, again, it's, they use standards, and for the most part, they use the right standards. Um, everybody, at Cal, don't get me started on CalDAV. Uh, everybody does it different. Everybody uses the standard differently. No one uses all of the standard, not even Apple, which is weird. But anyway. The question on the calendar? Yeah. I get duplicates if I've got daylight savings time four times on my calendar. Okay. I keep deleting them. So we can look. I mean, it, it may be that you have four. You're subscribed well, I'm to using four. A different I'm using I'm using calendar five. Yeah, calendar five. Versus yeah. The Apple from calendar, from I just from read over. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Is it syncing? Do you think to my calendar, my app? They calendar? do some weird things. Some calendar apps on iOS use the system's calendar store and let iOS do the syncing and just read and write data to and from that, and then apps like that actually do both. They talk directly to the server or read from the, the database, and if you have it doing both, it can actually get itself tied to knots. So, in the back? No? Okay. Not that far back. 
Uh, the nice part about uh, about iCloud is you can share editing rights and you can share calendars or you can even publish publicly. John and I have our, our Mac Geek Gab calendar and we stream every Mac Geek Gab live except this one. Um, and, uh, and so we, we both have editing rights on that calendar but we also have it read only for anyone that wants it and we've actually published it at macgeekgab.com slash calendar because that's easy. Um, and it, I, iCloud makes all that stuff really easy. Google Calendar, same kind of thing, calendar and contact sync. It's pretty, it works everywhere and it works natively with iOS, no problem. Uh, it is also free and you can do the same thing and share editing rights and all of that good stuff. Any questions about calendars? Everybody's, everybody, is everybody syncing their calendars that wants to? Uh, iCloud now, uh, and it's not all that recent, but relatively recently added document editing with pages and numbers and Keynote, and you can do that on the web. You can also do all the syncing, and it makes it really straightforward because it's perfectly supported in iOS and on your Mac uh, and in the web browser. Again, iCloud has uh, IMAP mail, calendar, and contacts, which makes life easy. So iCloud is definitely... As, as Apple users, there's no reason not to use iCloud. In fact, there's a lot of reasons to, uh, especially in addition to all of this stuff where you're controlling what goes in there in terms of, you know, you're controlling your mail, you're controlling your calendars. Uh, applications use iCloud, third-party apps use iCloud to store data and sync data, especially if you've got more than one iOS device or even if you have companion apps on the Mac and iOS. So by not having iCloud enable your potentially limiting the functionality of even some third-party apps, possibly even without realizing that. So. Everybody happy with iCloud? Good? Okay. Any questions? Sam but books don't take up a lot of space. You're not if you're eating 64 gigs of sample books, well, no, you probably I, have a problem. Uh, I, I mean, I know you told me at dinner that you start books and don't finish them, but yeah, yeah. He's, he's still the grandchild. Right? Yeah, well, photos is is right. Yeah, and maybe podcasts also. Yeah, yeah. But I can't offload those. I mean, I gotta just constantly delete. Right. That's right. Yeah. Archivist. Archivist. Yeah. Archivist. Yeah. yeah, it's good to know. <laughs> Glad to know they live somewhere. So the only reason you buy for buying this extra iCloud space is to keep the pages, keynotes, and uh, and email and documents that they create. storing doc yeah storing documents that you create uh, photos backups. That's what you can use your extra iCloud space for. Yeah. So why doesn't I make them let you do anything else? It's a good question. question. I mean, they got all the other stuff. Yeah. I've never tried to mess with, I mean, it books, again, books don't take up uh, that much space. Especially with sample pages. Yeah. How big are these sample books, though? Well, I know they don't Yeah. My, my, my book collection. Yeah. I, yeah, I know. I'm just trying to grab my head big. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It, it, sometimes, um, John, do you remember the name of the app that we just talked about that cleans off all the temp files from your iPhone, it's free. And off the time, it's not coming to me. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it actually works really well. Uh, there's an app out there. I'll find it when we finish here, and it it uh, will go onto your iPad and clean out, or on or your iPhone, and clean out all of those things that kind of fall into the other category. And it, uh, depending on how long you've been using the same kind of OS or backup set iPad, uh, you can save gigabytes of data that is just lost to you. Well, phone clean. Phone yeah. clean at phoneCleanApp.com, right? I think that's the site. Yep. Uh, I, I that's right. to my pocket. And yeah, right. Yeah, it's it's phone clean. That's totally it. And it's free right now. My guess is they're going to charge for it, uh, you know, uh, eventually. Because it's actually iMobi.com. iMobi? 
I M O B E E. E I E. I E. I M O B I E. Yeah. All right. There you go. Phone cleaner from I M O B. That's worth running on every iOS device you have. That makes sure it's backed up first, because you're gonna be mucking with things. But I haven't seen it. I've done it to all of mine in the house. Blocked on this Wi-Fi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know. That's what cellular data is for. Um, okay, back to my Mac is an interesting thing. Uh, it's actually really handy. It's very cool to be able to either see the files and folders on your Mac or even take control of your Mac screen from remote. Uh, when it's working, uh, it appears right in your Finder sidebar as if you're local. I don't know if Yukon's network blocks that too. But if it doesn't, it would be just like your home, and you just see it, and it, it is, um, any, any Macs that are connected to your iCloud account are going to uh, potentially be accessible there. There's no syncing, so your data is being pulled from across the network 100% of the time. So even if you open a file from your Mac at home and save it and go to open it again, it's going to read the whole thing from across the internet, um, which, depending on your size of the file and the speed of your connection may or may not be an issue. Uh, but there's no syncing, and it's only on the Mac. Why Apple hasn't made it work on your iPhone or your iPad is beyond me, because to me this is like, what device does Apple make that you would want to use to remotely access your stuff at home? Well, what about the one in your pocket? So um, you, get, you don't get to do this from iOS. Uh, I'll show you how to turn this on. You do need to, to enable something on your Mac here, so let's see if this works. So you go into System Preferences, and you go to Sharing, and you make sure Remote Management is on. That's the best way, the easiest way to do this. And then go to Computer Settings, and do this. Make sure VNC is on and put a password in. I'll, I'll, I'll show you why we're doing this, because this is how you're going to access it from iOS. Um, and that's just in the, in the secondary setting there. So make sure all that's on, and, uh, and then uh, there's some things we can do, which we'll talk about in a minute. You first, you want to make sure you've got the right router set up, because Back to My Mac doesn't always work well. Um, it does require a special router configuration. Apple routers typically, no surprise here, uh, can be auto-configured by your Mac. You don't have to do a darn thing. Uh, it creates all the right holes and tunnels and everything for Back to My Mac to work, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, an Apple router will also auto-wake your Mac, your sleeping Mac, for access to these services. Whether you're at home or remote, uh, the router actually takes over the, the job of advertising as your Mac, and it's pretty cool. If you don't have an Apple router, your Apple TV will also do this job. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, it used to, I used to say, and I probably even have it in here, make sure you have an Apple router, but an Apple TV will also do it. Um, with a third-party router, Back to My Mac usually works. Um, they don't have the auto-wake, uh, as I mentioned. But it, most third-party routers support the same methods that Apple devices use for creating all those tunnels for Back to My Mac, but it's not quite as reliable. Some also offer what's called a VPN, which lets you really, truly tunnel into your entire network, not just your Mac. Uh, and uh, the best is to have two routers, or one third-party router and one Apple TV on your network, so that you get the benefits of auto-wake, as well as a more full-featured router that lets you do things like tunneling into your network. How many people here use Apple routers? Okay. And how many people use third-party routers? Yeah, okay. It, I, I, you know, Apple makes, hardware-wise, their routers are excellent. Software-wise, their routers are crippled. Um, but, it, but that's typical of, of Apple. They want to keep it simple, and that's okay. Yeah? Two questions. One, do you have an article from Red Hat saying how the Apple TV does that? Um, it's, it, no. Uh, Apple does on their site. It, okay. It's called uh, Bonjour Sleep Proxy. <coughs> and it, when your computer goes to sleep, it looks for whatever the Bonjour Sleep Proxy device is on your network, mm -hmm. and then um, it, 
essentially hands off its services to that and its IP address. It's, like, it's all pretty magical, the way it works. And if you're a Lost fan, it checks in every 108 minutes. <laughs> so uh, they had to pick a number, and the, I guess the engineers were Lost fans, and so it's every 108 minutes it checks in with itself. And the second question is, does it have to be connected wired, or can, does it also work wireless? Uh, does it also work wireless? Well, if you have a router, it's going to... Oh, I see what you're saying. Does your Mac have to be connected yeah. wireless? Can I do it with no. my... No. It, it can be wireless as well. Yeah, it hands off. It hands off wireless. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, it's 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 a pretty cool thing, and it's you know it just works for most people, and you don't even realize it's happening until one day you say, "Hey, wait a minute, that computer was asleep. How did I just access its files?" That's how. That's but this is the beauty of Apple, right? I mean, this is what they do. They tie the whole widget together and make it so that it just works, and you don't have to think about it unless you want to share your screen from your iPhone, in which case it just doesn't work, and you don't have to think about it either. <laughs> Um, I didn't know that existed. Yeah, it does from, I think, 2010 onward. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like a 2008 MacBook Pro or iMac won't. But, yeah, yeah, there's a, yeah, it's it's not quite asleep, obviously. Yeah, yeah. It, you need to be on battery power. I'm uh, sorry, on, um, on, on AC power. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it doesn't advertise itself. Yeah. So if you want to do back to my Mac... Right, which is on by default, yeah. but many people turn it off. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, so if you want to do back to my Mac from iOS, as I mentioned, you can turn on VNC uh, in that network preferences there, and or sharing preferences, I should say. That allows, VNC is a, uh, a, a standard way of controlling a screen remotely and is the path in. Uh, an iOS client is needed, a separate one. My favorite one is Screen. It's not cheap, it's 20 bucks, but it's worth every penny. It works really well, it's smooth, it's simple. Um, but Mocha VNC Lite is, I would say, 80% as good, and it's free. So uh, if you're just looking to do this occasionally, Mocha VNC is going to be fine. If you're doing it regularly, you're going to want the smoothness and the features of Screens. Uh, what's your favorite? I know you've got one. What's your favorite one to use? Well, I have, I, for years I used Jolly. Yeah? Jolly Fast VNC, mm -hmm. but it's not so fast anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, but I've been told that that's a bug in, in uh, OS X, starting with, I think it was Mountain Lion. Okay. The VNC server built into the OS has got slowness issues. Interesting. Have you experienced that? Well, I haven't used Jolly. I've used Screens. Yeah. And Screens uses the extensions of VNC that lets you log in as a Mac user yeah. as opposed to just, you know, capturing the, the raw screen. Yeah. And perhaps there's a, maybe it's more efficient that way. Yeah. I haven't had an issue with it. It works great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in order for VNC to work, you do need to create a manual port forward on your router. Um, the best place to learn how to do this is called portforward.com. Uh, you put in what you're trying to do, which in this case is VNC, and what kind of router you have, and it will show you screenshots of how to do that. Portforward.com makes life easy, and that way I don't have to stand up here and try and tell you how to do this on six different types of routers, because I won't remember. <laughs> and they get it right, and they show you screens, and it, it's perfect. Or you create a VPN, which is a tunnel into your network. So that's back to my Mac for the screen. Now, file access, uh, again, is, is handled differently on iOS. We need a different app to do it. I like Files Connect from Antasia. It allows access to all your files um, on your Mac via your iOS device. Works very, very well. Cloud Connect Pro does more. It doesn't, it's, it's the same people, but this does everything. It bakes VNC and file sharing and music streaming and all of that stuff into one iOS app, so you can get all your bang for your buck with that one, and it works fairly well. And I haven't had speed issues with that either. It just lowers my iTunes account balance, because I keep buying these things existing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, it, it, it's crazy that iOS doesn't have a way to access your Mac's files. But I think, I think their thought process is that you should just store everything in the iCloud, and then yeah. 
and then it, but even then you can't access your files. And they're all in one big mess. Well, you can create folders in your iCloud folder. You just can't get to those folders right. from your iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. But it's awesome. Because of course the tags are the solution. Uh-huh. You can't get to the tags from your iPhone either. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, Apple's splitting the baby on this one. They say that no docu applications should, you know, you should it, you should live in an application centric world, and you don't have to manage your files anymore. And yet, on the Mac now, they basically let you put whatever you want in the iCloud folder, just as long as you don't want it from anything but a Mac. Right. Yeah. So, I, I, they got to decide what they're doing with this. And really, what they need to do is look at how people manage their files, which is by managing their files and allow access from there. But anyway, I digress. Uh, so this is all doable file and document access uh, from iOS or Mac. We've talked about the ways of doing that. It does require a network connection and only live data, right? No syncing. As I mentioned, iCloud's a little bit better. Dropbox. Cloud Station, SugarSync, Transporter, all of those are even better because they get you out of the Apple ecosystem and just manage things without some, you know, philosophical um, vision that we just discussed. And then there's Google Drive. All the files live in the cloud. Uh, it's accessible from anywhere. You can edit right in the web browser. The iOS apps allow access. It's infinitely shareable with others with control. Works really, really well. Anybody here using Google Drive? Google, it used to be called Google Docs. I still call it Google Docs. Yeah. I, I saw Google Drive. I'm like, what are we talking about? 15 gigs free. 15 gigs free. Yep. It's great. Uh, we use it at work all the time for sharing spreadsheets. It's awesome. You can live edit right there. It's killer. That's the way to go. Um, Another back to my Mac on iOS, presence, five bucks for three bucks for three months from flyingmac.com. Accesses all your Macs files from anywhere, including a web browser. So you're not just limited to iOS with this. You can do it from your Windows machine. Also very handy. Obviously iOS. Good stuff. You mentioned one path. Yeah, go ahead. You know, like OneDrive, Microsoft Drive. Oh, no, OneDrive's actually great. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You're right. Very similar. It's all they're all the same, right? There's everything. There's iCloud, and then there's everything that works the way we want it to. <laughs> Do you include iCloud Drive in that? Well, yeah, I iCloud Drive, but that doesn't work the way we want it to, unless you're on your Mac, and then it works the way you want it to. But only because we kind of forced out this hand. One thing I didn't include here, but I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't suggest and, and really rave about highly, is BitTorrent Sync. I've just recently moved to that. I built this presentation back in January when I thought it was coming, uh, and then the blizzard came, or didn't come. I don't know. Did you get it? And we didn't. It was, it was one of those. It was one of those, right? I got it. We and you had didn't. one long, continuous blizzard. Well, there was that. Yeah. <laughs> three months. Yeah. Yeah, I know. We had 100, over 100 inches of snow. I still got two feet of snow in my yard. So. What town are you in? Uh, I'm in Durham, New Hampshire. What's the nearest big? Uh, Portsmouth is. Portsmouth. Yeah, I'm 10 I know minutes Portsmouth. from Portsmouth. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, uh, BitTorrent Sync is one that I've really become enamored with lately. I've actually moved all of my personal syncing to it. What's cool, so BitTorrent obviously has been around for a long time. They, they created the whole concept of uh, distributing files over the internet. Uh, and and distributing the load of that. So if you have you know a hundred people with a copy of a file, you can get bits and pieces of it from each of them, and then reassemble the file on your own. BitTorrent Sync does the same thing, but it doesn't share your files with hundreds of people. It only shares your files with your computers. But what's cool about it is there is no server. Every computer is an equal participant. You can, and I do, put BitTorrent Sync on my Synology. But I also put it on my Mac. I put it on all my Macs at home, and 
Every one of them is an equal player. They all maintain a copy of the folder or folders that they sync. And if one of them is offline, it doesn't matter. The other ones have a copy of the data and will send it to me, either locally or remotely. It all works just like it's supposed to. Uh, it is an awesome thing. You can share. BitTorrent Sync 2 is out now. Uh, it's only, I think it's only in total, it's only about two years old, but it relies on the BitTorrent protocol, which is decade plus old. Very robust. Uh, BitTorrent Sync 2 allows you to sync up to 10 folders for free. And then if you want more than 10, you can pay them 40 bucks a year or 30 bucks a year or something like that. Uh, and, and there's sharing, so I can have one folder that's shared with you and one folder that's shared with you, and you can control all kinds of access to it. It's fantastic. And again, because it, there is no one server, it's very, very simple to set up. You just install BitTorrent Sync on one machine, and then you install it elsewhere. They've got iOS apps. And that's where I have all my personal files. It, everything's uh, sent encrypted, and it's all <coughs> stored on your machine. It is currently separate. It is, it, uh, with, BitTorrent, with BitTorrent Sync 2, it is built by BitTorrent, which was not the case with uh, BitTorrent Sync 1. I mean, it was BitTorrent's app that was packaged by somebody else, whereas now it's packaged by BitTorrent. Um, but it's, yeah, it's not part of Synology's store yet. And I, I've talked to the people at Synology. They tell me, oh, yeah, we want to have it in the store. I'm like, well, Here's the number of the guy that is going to make that happen for you, BitTorrent, and they, I don't know, well, who knows. A lot of times the things that are not built by technology, the global people have the same problem with the 5M. Yeah. Where, you know, getting crash card working on either technology or 5M. Well, that's a whole different story. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not. Third party ones, oftentimes you have to. Crash plan's different, though, because crash plan requires the fat app, the Mac app, to yeah. manage, and so you've got the weird tunneling and. and yeah, you, have to get the right version of Java you do. Which yeah, is not which is not always straightforward. Yeah, no, BitTorrent. It's it's just one app that you install. There's no dependencies or anything. It's it's fairly straightforward, but it's not as straightforward as it could be for the Synology. But in terms of putting it on your Mac or your iOS device, it's you know like anything else, and it just works. Totally magic, and it's great. So I can't recommend it enough. Um, I've been really happy with it. I went through some stumbles with it, you know, probably six months ago, but especially with version 2, it really, really works well. So. I've used it recently to send. What's that? No, I've used it recently to send, like, large files to people. Yeah. Someone wanted this, and I couldn't give them a USB. You can't give them a USB drive. So yep, and, it, and it's great for that. You can share individual files yeah. one time, or you can share entire folders um, full time. It's great. <laughs> and then one other I'll throw out there. I know one person mentioned <coughs> it uh, called 1Password. Anybody here using 1Password? Yeah, good. Awesome. Um, Let's you move your, your passwords from device to device, syncs them. Uh, John, I know, likes LastPass. Which I'm is, a one password pusher. You are. I can tell. <laughs> yeah. He you know, I've been it. using um, iCloud password, or I call it Keychain. And I use both now, but that and one password, just because iCloud Keychain is so well integrated yeah. with Safari here. I just store everything in both now. Um, and I feel comfortable that way because I, I trust my one password data. I firmly believe that my iCloud keychain will get reset all the time when it does. But it's still convenient. So. Any other questions before we uh, before wrap up? I do have one quick question. Yeah. Why do you prefer BitTorrent Sync to Transport? Uh, because I don't have to rely, because, because no device is the server. If my transporter dies, my data stops syncing. Right. If my. Unless, yeah, unless you get two of them. <laughs> right. That's true. That's right. Yeah, you have two transporters, and you can even have them in separate locations, which then gives you, you know, off-site access. And it's great for that. It, it, you know, it's not that the transporter is bad. It's that I don't, I don't want my access to my documents to be reliant on any one device, which is the really the benefit of of like something like Dropbox, right? Because I mean, it's one service, but Dropbox has more than one server, yeah. and they don't go down, right? But um, BitTorrent sync, you know, it's great. I like it. Really what I need to do is find a BitTorrent, like find, maybe like John, I need to, you know, you need to have an encrypted 
store or something, so that I have this off-site BitTorrent storage and that sort of thing. Anything else? Are we, are, did you have enough, or should I start pouring more data at you? Questions? More. Conversion from POP to IMAP, the, the last step is just to set up the IMAP account on your device, right? And then once, you, you're, once you've moved all the data from your Mac, then you just set up the IMAP account on, your, on all your you other devices. You shouldn't really need to do any checking or testing at that point. Well, your test will be to look at your inbox and see if it matches on your Mac. And it's either going to yeah. tell you your password's wrong or but it's going to no show moving, you. No moving, no nothing. No. Just because it's all IMAP at that point. That's the beauty. Once, once it's done, it, it, life is so much better. I moved to anyway. IMAP when I got my Trio 650. So this must have been 2005. And it was like the whole world opened up for me. And it was awesome because nobody else had it. Right? I mean, you, you, people had it, but nobody had smartphones. So I, it was this sense of freedom that I didn't have to like circle. I, you know, I had started a business and we had all this stuff going. I didn't have to circle back by the house every four hours just to check my email and make sure the world wasn't crazy. Now that tethered, you know, I can come shoot it, but that's okay. That's all good. <laughs> yeah. I have a question, and I don't want you to get into politics, but what is your feeling about Hillary using her own server? You talked about servers out of your home and what a nightmare it was. How do you think Bill was able to handle it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you, you know, we have, the, the, the problem really comes down to that we don't, have the right laws in place in terms of archiving all those memos, right? I mean, it used to be when everything was on paper, the, the, the everything was put on, uh, you know, three copies were created, and one of them was put in a folder, and it went to the archives, and it stayed there forever. And, and now, you know, we don't have that policy with email. It's supposed to be done, but no one's enforcing it. And so we've really lost decades of our national history, and like, it's it's really cool to be able to go back and see how laws were made a hundred years ago. Why why does this law exist the way it does? Well, you look at all the memos, you're like, oh, I see what they meant to do. They wrote it poorly, and now we're screwed. But at least you know the intentions were sound, right? I mean, it, it, it's it's cool to be able to see that history. And we've got probably two decades where that history doesn't. Exist. Well, I mean, I ran my own mail server for a long time. I, um, you know, for Mac Observer, we, for years, you know, we started this before the term blog even existed. So we created our own content management system because one didn't exist. I had to write it myself. I didn't have to write my own mail server, but I set up my own because there was no cloud hosted mail for, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's a bear running your own, but I did. I, I mean, we ran it on QMail and then ProcMail for a little while and, and, you know, it was our own machine, and so there was nobody else that could have access. No, that, and that was a really nice thing until I realized that one day it went down, and I realized I was the only person on the planet that knew where all the pieces were. Other people could have figured it out. It would have taken about a week, probably. Um, but after that day, I decided we're moving to cloud email because I don't want to be the only one on the planet that is responsible for. I mean, there's probably, we, we host the email for not just us, but uh, a lot of the sites we represent with Backbeat Media. And so, you know, there's maybe 100 people that will really rely on email. So in your estimation, then, that whatever email that you capture is, is actually lost? It's gone. Yeah. I mean, unless she has backups. Right? I mean, think about it. She could. <laughs> yeah, she'll be subpoenaed. <laughs> well, yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm not saying that. That's right. That's I right. Imagine it I would imagine, yeah. Yeah, but no, I, you know, it, it, it's, I mean, I'm glad that this is happening because it will force some policy. And I think that's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, it brings up an interesting point because one of the trends these days, and I won't get into politics at all, but I've done this in the corporate space, but there's this whole concept of BYOD. Right. On your own device where you're kind of mixing your professional and your personal, and I would say that can you access those emails that were deleted, and I would actually say it depends. Right. Because a lot of times, a copy is 
stored on your device. So if Hillary or Sarah or whoever decided to mix these worlds, if there's a backup of the device from right. some point in time, that data could be retrievable. It's um if she used an iPhone. Uh, or any well, see, no, that's the thing. If it, I mean, if you're using IMAP, right? When if if I delete an email from here, really it moves it into the trash folder, okay? Which then moves it into the trash folder on the server, and then moves it into the trash folder on all of my other Macs and my iPhone. And my mail server is set that anything in the trash folder is purged after 30 days. And when it's purged from the trash folder, it's purged from the trash folder there, and then that's synced here and everywhere else. But again, like John said, if, if there was a backup made at any point in time, it, it, the data's there, but I mean, can you imagine trying to figure out, okay, now we're gonna go through the trash. I mean, this is, you, you know, th th you're not gonna find what you're looking for unless you know exactly what you're looking for. Like I mentioned, time machine. So say I have a yeah. time machine backup and I used Apple Mail. I've done this. I've gone back and retrieved something that I put in my trash. Right, right, oh, yeah, because you knew it was there. That's right. the thing. Is so the thing is, I, I guess it, it, um, it's, a, it's an interesting question because the, the question was, you know, if, if you delete it, is it gone? And I would say, I mean, you hear the same warning, you know, from kids these days. Yeah. You know, don't, you know, don't do that sexy video because, you know, even if you delete it, yeah. it's, like, out, I it's, it's the, out there. I say the internet's like Vegas. Everything that happens on the internet stays on the internet. But that's not entirely, I mean, if, you know, if mail gets deleted, it may have been saved by the person you sent it to or the person that sent it to you. But again, I mean, you, you got to know what you're looking for and know where to look for it. And, I mean, we're talking about needles and haystacks. It, without, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I think it sucks that this happened. Not, not for the, take the political stuff out of it, just for our, our history. is gone. We've got a lot, and I'm, and, you know, she got caught, but, I, and it caught's the wrong word. I mean, I, I, I don't even know. I haven't dug into it. I don't know how much intention was there versus just, again, we choose convenience. And it's like, well, you know, my iPhone's set up with my email, and I'm just, I'm going to send you an email. Uh, you know. What email server was she using? Because she would have gone probably Gmail. Probably Gmail, right? That's what we all use. That, that I'll agree with. <laughs> totally. You know, I mean, you know, unless they set up their own server and they actually yeah, use their, 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 their home server. Use their server at home. Okay. If here's one that was here. Here's that was here. All his emails are housed on the RNC and they dumped four million of them. So we could do a bit compared to that. But just a little bit. Yeah. It, it ha I'm, yeah, it's not. It, the problem is that we, we lost in the quick transition to. to you know, using technology for all of this stuff, we just lost some some procedures. You know, and it, it's sad, but uh, but like, uh, but it's not limited to Hillary. I mean, we we're all in that. Book. I I have every email that I've ever sent or received since I started sending and receiving email, and uh, I know I'm I'm you know in the minority there. I know John does basically the same thing. I know that the first email you have, I think we the oldest email we both have in our archives is the same one. So sadly, did you lose another some? thing is, uh, is, is, some of you may have heard this term, but I'll, I'll call it dish rot. But I have to, the thing is emails, even if you don't do anything, sometimes, especially with the, with the local store like Pop, yeah. I have emails from the Pop days that were corrupt. That didn't make it, yeah. And this is actually something that I've seen when you over from pop to IMAP or from one email system yeah. to another. You can lose Some stuff. of them just got yeah. screwed up. Yep. It happened. How it happened, it's either the subject matter is gone or the date got corrupted. I, I have some where the data is all transposed because the, the, the back end mechanism that keeps track of all that stuff got confused. Yep. So I'll have someone with one subject, but the content is no content. entirely different. Yeah. Or there's no content. Yep. Or, or the, the date's wrong. Date or, yep. Is Yep, it's true. I've yeah. found that you have to be careful how many how many messages you keep in one folder with IMAP. I think yes. you find that you get if you get above five thousand, you start to have more than one. I archive my email off. I keep two years worth of stuff in my IMAP archives or my IMAP server, <coughs> and the rest I archive off onto 
you know, on my Mac folders, uh, just on my Mac at home. And that, that's, a, that's a good balance for me. And it keeps things from, like you said, just getting totally tied in knots. Because that only goes in dependence on how many inputs you need to run that query. And also the quantity of email you get. And it is, but I found that the general... It's actually less about the server and more about Apple Mail. I mean, yeah, but you're right. It, Outlook, too. What? Outlook, oh. But, you know, saving all those emails, we had a lawsuit, oh, this was more than 10 years ago now, um, <laughs> that we won, uh, and it was a six-figure judgment that would have probably made the difference between our business surviving and not, um, because I saved the entirety of our email correspondence with this one company over, two, over the course of two years. Wow. Yeah. And my lawyer's like, you have all this stuff? I said, yeah. He said, print it all out. Okay. And he said, we'll send it to him as discovery. Five, five days later. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, he said, he said, make sure the one email that's going to prove your case is in there, but give oh, them God. everything no. before that <laughs> and <laughs> everything after it so that they don't, so that they get surprised by it. I said, okay, got it all? No problem. <laughs> yeah. They found it. They, they read through everything. Wow. But it didn't matter. I mean, it, you know. It just, it just meant we didn't get them by surprise, but it yeah. didn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, they came and offered us a deal, and it all worked out fine. Oh, yeah. We got what we should have gotten, and that was all. And it was actually a three-line email. <laughs> That's, that was the crux of the whole thing. And then years of performance based on, we have this little agreement, and then two years of performance based on the agreement. So, like, yeah, we did the same thing. But anyway, it's worth saving it, I think. But, you know, it was worth it for me. Not good for them, I guess. <laughs> All depends on your perspective. <laughs> Secure until a subpoena. Um, speaking of that, in many places, your fingerprint, you know, a lot of people think about uh, the fingerprint ID, touch ID on these devices as a security uh, device and it's, or a security feature. It's not. It is a convenience feature. Um, there's nothing, it, it, it merely lets you unlock your device a different way. Um, but it does not add any security to it. It allows you to potentially have a longer password because it's less inconvenient to unlock your device because you don't have to type in the long password as frequently. But it is a convenience feature and in some places, it's been tested, and if your device can be unlocked with your fingerprint, that is something you can be forced to do, whereas typing in your password is considered incriminating yourself. So, again, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody in this room, uh, but it is, it is interesting to think about, and it, it really is a security, a, a, a convenience feature, and, and Apple treats it that way, as they should. It's, you know, there's nothing overly secure. You know, if you, you can't tell it, don't unlock my iPhone if my fingerprint isn't there, you can always still use the passcode. So it's convenience, not security. I got some what about if you are unfingerprintable, like me? Yeah. Does, have you tried it? Does it no, not work? I haven't tried it. The government I, lists her as un, unfingerprintable. Oh, Good okay. for you. <laughs> I'd love to learn about your hypno. <laughs> Sewing, I think. I oh, think yeah. That's, fabric that's what all the former CIA agents said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I wonder if, if it would work. I mean, your fingers might still have a unique enough pattern to them. I don't know, right? It, it, again, Touch ID is different than being, you know, fingerprinted. So uh, it could work. Was I surprised, though? I was really I'm uh, sure. That's what they all said. <laughs> all the same with Touch ID, and I'm, this is all I'm going to say. You don't necessarily have to use your finger. You can use the tip of your nose. Uh, people have tried other things. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Appendages, that's... Yep. No, I'm, I'm being totally serious. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But on entering passwords, it, it's probably important to know that you can turn on the complex password feature. Yes. Right. That's right. Four it, digits it, isn't going to cut it. it. Four digits, no. <laughs> A, a kid with an afternoon can hack your four-digit password. <laughs> Unless you have it set to, to erase out of ten failed attempts. Right. Yeah, I think I've done, yeah, ten. I think with the default setting. 
Yep. Yep. If somebody tries ten times, it'll it wipes the data. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's a time there's a time lag in there. It resets. Question for you. Yeah. You talked a lot about how we consume our data online in the sense of from our computers to wherever we are and so on. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's almost where I went at the end, kind of off the slides anyway, because it, it, it is, it's always an important part of the discussion. So, um, you know, backup uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell, if your data is only in one place, it, you, you need to assume that it no longer exists. Um, you need to have multiple copies of anything that you ever want to see again. And that's just because Every medium that we have found has flaws. And the biggest flaw is the one sitting in your chairs right now. <laughs> right? We all, they, you know, we delete stuff that we didn't mean to delete, and it happens. Or we change things that we're too dumb to realize we shouldn't have changed, and we needed the old copy of it. So you need backups to protect against all of that. Uh, my backup strategy is I use Time Machine because it's there and simple. and uh, but I rarely, it is actually the first thing I go to when I need to recover a piece of data because it's ET. Um, it almost always fails me because Time Machine is complaining that the drive is full or it doesn't this or it doesn't that. So um, my backup beyond Time Machine consists of at least two things. One is a daily clone of my main hard drive, uh, which is local, so right next to the computer. But a daily clone happens at 6.30 p.m. every day, and that way, if something happens in my drive and the computer dies or the computer itself dies, I can take that drive and plug it into any other Mac on the planet that's newer than 2007, and it will start it up, and I can continue working as though nothing happened. And it, at the worst, revert to 6.30 yesterday, but be, again, because of BitTorrent Sync and Dropbox and all of that, and IMAP, I probably have all my data up to the minute once it sinks and starts up. So that's step one. Step two is I run crash plan um, to do backups offline or off-site. I do have a crash plan account. I have a family account with them, and so I back up all my computers to their servers. And then I also, uh, Pilot Pete, for anybody that listens to the podcast, he and I have exchanged uh, big, large hard drives. Actually, we both use Drobos. He leaves, one at my, he leaves his at my house, I leave mine at his house and we back up crash plan to each other's homes that way. So we have offsite backups that are 15 minutes away. And if we need a large chunk of data restored, we can drive over, get the drive, bring it back, and restore it that way. And, uh, and that, that's my backup strategy. And you know, to be fair, Dropbox and, and BitTorrent Sync are part of that, right? Because any data that I'm saving, as long as I'm online, is synced at least to one other device that I own. Well, except for versioning. Except for versioning. That's correct. That's right. But yeah, you know, it's, and that's why you want to do the, you know, the cloning and the, the yeah. crash plan keeps versioning. Uh, Time Machine obviously is it has versioning as part of its whole core, and and you need versioning. And and then the other part of it is, uh, you know, on my disk station, all my where all my movies and music are and all that, it's a five bay disk station. And so if any one of those drives dies, I don't lose my data. But that doesn't protect me. If I delete a movie, it's gone. And so all of that is sent over the internet to Pete's house. Until the day that Comcast reinstates their data caps, because I use about 800 gigs a month. They're there, they just don't enforce them. Correct. They're there, but they don't enforce them, at least not in my area. I've seen it. Um, I don't. I don't have it with the the um, data that's backed up to Crash Plan servers. I do have it with the data that's backed up to Pete's house, and I I blame that on the speed of the drive that I have at Pete's house. It, what's over there is a first gen Drobo, one of the slowest 
grade units you could ever have gotten. And when it needs to go through and prune stuff, it just takes forever. Um, but it, it eventually finishes. Um, it just takes a while, like days, weeks, sometimes. Yeah. And you use carbon copy cloner for the, the clone copies? I use carbon copy cloner for the clone and also for my, uh, I said that I have my music library on my Mac and I sync that to the disk station every night and I use carbon copy cloner. How do you automate the 630 carbon copy cloner? In the, in the software in itself? In the software. It's got a scheduler built in. It'll wake up your Mac. It'll mount the network drive. It'll eject the drives. It's awesome. I used to use SuperDuper, and the carbon copy cloner eclipsed them in terms of their ability to kind of manage all of that mount, unmount, wake, sleep stuff that I just moved everything around. But I still love David. Drive by his house in the morning. Hopefully, he won't throw anything down. <laughs> Good? Thanks for having me.